Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. Test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Kingsbury College, can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm ringing to find out about one of your courses. Yes. Is that a daytime or an evening course? Evening. Right. I'll just get a few details from you, if I may. Fine. Could I have your full name, first of all? It's Peter Wright. That's W-R-I-G-H-T. OK. And I don't need to know your exact age, but can you tell me which of these age groups you belong to? 18 to 25, 26 to 35, 36 to 45, or over 45? 18 to 25. Fine. And do you have a job, or are you a full-time student? I'm an accountant. I just do courses in my spare time, for interest. OK. Right. And your address, Mr Wright? It's 11 Forest Road. F-O-R-E-S-T? Yes. Mm. Is that in Kingsbury? Yes, it is. I'm just down the road here. And do you have a phone number? It's double nine two four seven one. That's my home number. I haven't got a work number. That's fine. We probably won't need it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, you want to register for a course? Yes, cookery. Do you happen to know the exact title of the course? We've got Thai cookery on Wednesdays, or Mexican cookery on Fridays, or... Mexican. I'd like to do both, but I'm busy on Wednesdays. OK. Well, you can always do the other one next term, I suppose. Now, do you know when it begins? Is it the 26th of March? That's right. And it's £45 in total. That's including the ingredients. How would you like to pay? Card? Cash? Can I send a cheque? You can, yes. As long as it arrives at least one week before the start of the course. OK. And I'll just give you a reference number. If you could make a note of it and write it on the back. Yes. It's CZ943. Yes, got that. Good. Well, there's just one last question. Do you have any special requirements that I should make a note of? Yes, there is one thing. I use a wheelchair. Right. So you need to have access for that. OK. Don't worry, your room is on the ground floor and I'll make sure there are no steps involved. We can always put a ramp in. Thanks. So, we look forward to seeing you on the 26th of March. That is the end of part one. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear Melanie, a student, talking to one of her lecturers about her studies. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Excuse me, Dr. Johnson. May I speak to you for a minute? Sure. Come in. I'm Melanie Griffin. I'm taking your course in population studies. Right. Uh, well, Melanie, how can I help you? I'm having a bit of trouble with a second assignment. Mm -hmm. And it's due in 12 days. What sort of trouble are you having? Is the assignment question a problem? Well, that's part of the problem. I'm also having... I've been having trouble getting hold of the books. I've been to the library several times and all the books are out. <sighs> Sounds like you should have started borrowing books a bit earlier. Well, I had a really big assignment due in for another course and... I've been spending all my time on that, and I thought... Uh, you might get an extension of time to finish your assignment for me? If that's possible, but I don't know... If... Well, yes, it is possible, but uh, extensions are normally given only for medical or compassionate reasons. Otherwise, it's really a question of organizing your study, and we don't like giving extensions to students who simply didn't plan their work properly. Uh, what did you get for your first assignment? I got 87%. Hmm. Yes, you did very well, indeed. So, obviously, you can produce good work. I don't think I'll need too much extra time, as long as I can get hold of some of the important references. Well, since you did so well in your first assignment, I'm prepared to give you an extra two weeks for this one. So, that'll mean you'll need to submit it about a month from now. Oh, thank you. Now, what about the reading materials? Have you checked out the journal articles in the list? Um, uh, no, not yet. There were about 20 of them, and I wasn't sure which ones would be most useful or, or important. Well, they're all useful, but I don't expect anyone to read them all because a number of them deal with the same issues. <sighs> uh, let me give you some suggestions. The article by Anderson and Hawker is really worth reading. Right, I'll read that one. You should also read the article by Jackson, uh, but just look at the part in the research methodology, how they did it. Okay, Jackson, got that. And if you have time, the one by Roberts says very relevant things, although it's not essential. So, okay, if it's useful, I'll try and read that one. Now, the one by Morris. Uh, I wouldn't bother with that at this stage if I were you. Okay, I won't bother with Morris. Oh, now, someone told me the article by Cooper is important. Well, yes, in a way. But just look at the last part, where he discusses the research results. And uh, lastly, there's Forster. I can't think why I included that one. It's not bad, and could be of some help, but not that much. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now let's deal with the assignment question. Uh, what's the problem there? It's the graph on page 2. What well, seems to be the problem? It's just the bar graph showing reasons why people change where they live. Well, I've got a photocopy, but the reasons at the bottom are missing. Ah, oh, OK. Uh, look at the first bar on the graph. Mm -hmm. Now, that indicates the number of people who move because they want more space. Oh, I see. Bar one. OK. Now, what about the next bar? Bar two is to do with the people living nearby, disturbing them. So they chose to move away to somewhere quieter. Now let's look at bar number three. Another reason people change their place of living is because they want to be closer to the city. OK. Proximity to the city is an issue. Now, bar number four refers to problems when the owner of the property won't help fix things that go wrong. In other words, the owner is not helpful, and so the tenants move out. OK. Now, what about bar five? Uh, bar five is about those people who move because they need a bus or train to get them into the city or to go to work. OK. And bar six? Bar number six is interesting. That reason was given quite a lot. People moving because they wanted to be in a more attractive neighborhood. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. In the 8th century, the Chinese invented paper and woodblock printing. Remember that up to this time, very few people could read and write, and so only a very small number of people could understand written history. Suddenly, many books appeared, and many more people learnt to read. In the 14th century, the first printing press was invented in Germany. This reduced how long it took to produce books. The new printing technique quickly spread to other parts of the world. More books appeared, and even more people learnt to read. The first printed newspaper appeared in 1605 and the first daily newspaper in 1702. Now, people could read news stories soon after the event happened, and every event was recorded and stored. The problem with newspaper history is that newspaper reporters could tell the stories they wanted to tell, and not necessarily the truth. Photography was the next important development, we generally agree that photography was born in 1839. Some of the earliest photographs that the public saw were images of the American Civil War. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People were shocked by the photographs of dead soldiers and for the first time saw the reality of war. By 1850, photographs appeared regularly in newspapers and people now expected the truth. At the end of the 19th century came the first motion picture camera. Soon, history was being recorded as moving images. In the 1930s, television brought moving images into people's homes. More and more people saw history as it happened, and more and more history was recorded. Today, of course, we expect that every event in the world is recorded. Satellite TV and the Internet allow people to watch any event, anywhere in the world, as it happens. It doesn't matter if the TV cameras are not there. People carry around mobile phones and can record any incident and then share it online. Families have their own video cameras and record their own history. Children now grow up watching their parents and grandparents on film. I'm sure you'll agree that the transition from storytelling to what we have today has been dramatic, and I hope that... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about the Kentish pipe, a 17th century musical instrument. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening. I'd like to introduce Geoffrey Rourke of the Early Music Foundation. Geoffrey has recently restored a genuine 17th century Kentish pipe and, as you all know, will be giving us a recital on it later this evening. But first, He's kindly agreed to talk to us about this exciting and little-known instrument. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin, if I may, by talking to you about the rather unusual construction of the Kentish pipe. The main part of the instrument, as you can see, is a long, straight wooden tube, which we call the chanter. This one is in beech wood, but other woods were used. At one end, there is the air bag. This rests under the arm of the player, <laughs> like this. The blowpipe that inflates the air bag is quite long and bends round the front of the body to be inserted in the mouth of the player, like this. You see, the flexible nature of this tube is a unique feature of the Kentish pipe. In my restored version here, the blowpipe is, I'm sorry to confess, made out of plastic. In the original version, it would have been made out of leather using an elaborate stitching and waxing technique. However, the skills required to do this have now been lost. Good old plastic was the only alternative we could come up with. The airbag is obviously a modern replacement too. This time it is made out of leather 
and as far as we can be certain, is likely to be pretty much identical to the original. A particularly soft and supple yet strong leather is required. Ordinary shoe leather would start to crack in no time. The main pipe, or chanter, is original of course, as its rather battered appearance makes obvious, I would imagine. But it still sounds pretty good after nearly 400 years. We can actually put a precise date on it, because the maker kindly inscribed it for us. Just here. You probably can't see it. JD, the maker's initials, and the date... 1634. The most recent feature is the reed, the part that actually makes the noise. Although probably identical in every way to the original, it is in fact a piece from a plant picked yesterday morning by my son by the river near our house. So, that's the construction. But why bother with the bag, you may be wondering? Why not just blow directly into the pipe? Well, you can play the instrument that way. You can just detach the bag like this and blow into this hole here. But you need a lot of breath to do it. Much more than, say, a flute or clarinet. After a few notes, you have to stop to take a breath. The bag allows the player to breathe while continuing to play. This meant that music for the Kentish pipe could be loud and fast, the way they liked it in Kent in the 17th century, no doubt. So, we have the pipe, but unfortunately we don't have the music. Not a single piece of music written specifically for the Kentish Pipe has been found. Luckily, some of my colleagues from the Early Music Foundation have adapted some traditional music from the period for the Kentish Pipe, and we hope this will closely reflect the impression performances on the original instrument would have made. During the recital, I'm also going to play some modern pieces, ranging from rock to classical. And I hope you'll agree with me that the instrument can bring its own special character to familiar tunes. Well, thank you very much for that. And I'm sure we're looking forward very much to hearing you play it after the break. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. In this video, we will discuss about task 1 of writing module, so you get an idea how to write a table graph. So without wasting any time, let's start with the video. Now look at today's table graph. The chart below shows the percentage of young people at university in 5 countries in 2005 and 2015 and summarize the information by selecting and reporting the main features and make comparisons where relevant. Here you can see the proportion of young people at university in five countries, namely Canada, New Zealand, US, Australia and Italy is given in the year 2005 and 2015 and also percentage is given. Now take a quick look on data. Here you can see Canada had 70% in 2005 and 80% in the year 2015. And New Zealand had 50% and 65% in both years. And interestingly, the USA has only 40% in first year. And in 2015, the percentage was doubled, as you can see, by 80%. Australia had 
65% of youngsters in 2005 and after 10 years it increased by 10% and became 75% and surprisingly Italy had same proportion in both years by 50% and if you noticed Canada had the highest proportion in both years by 70 and 80% as compared to other countries. So this is our table graph. Now we will discuss sample answer. First look at introduction. In this paragraph we will rephrase the given statement in task 1. Now let's read. The chart below shows the percentage of young people at university in 5 countries in 2005 and 2015. Now let's read. The tabular chart depicts the information about the proportion of youngsters who were at the University of Five Nations such as Canada, New Zealand, the US, Australia and Italy in 2005 and 2015. Means we have written here tabular chart instead of writing table graph. Depicts means illustrates the information about the proportion. Here we have written the proportion instead of writing percentage of youngsters who were at the University of Five Countries such as Canada, New Zealand, the US, Australia and Italy in 2005 and 2015. So this is our paraphrasing of introduction. Now we will write BP1. In this paragraph we will discuss about these three countries. Now let's read. Looking first at countries Canada and New Zealand in 2005, 70% of younger people at university in Canada. Here you can see in 2005, 70% of younger people at university in Canada. However, the figure of New Zealand was a half. A half means 50%. Means the figure of New Zealand was a half by 50% in 2005. A decade later means after 10 years which is the year 2015, these figures rose to 80% and 65% orderly. Means these figure increased to 80% and 65% orderly. After that, America had 80% young people at university in 2015. As you can see, America had 80% young people at university in 2015 whilst it was twofold than that of the percentage of youngsters in 2005. As you can see, it was twofold means doubled than that of the percentage of youngsters in 2005. So this is the end of BP1. Now we will discuss body paragraph 2. In this paragraph, we will discuss about Australia and Italy. Now let's read. Turning to the two remaining countries. In Australia, youngsters at university increased by one tenth from 65 to 75 percent in the given years. Here you can see in Australia, youngsters at university increased by one tenth means by 10 percent from 65 to 75 percent in the given years. Here we have written in the given years instead of writing 2005 and 2015. Then the proportion of students who were at Italian university was at par by 50% in both years. Means the proportion of Italian university students was at par means equal by 50% in both years. So this is the end of PP2. Now we will write overview. In this paragraph we will write the striking features of the graph. Now let's read. Overall. Canada had the highest percentage of young people at university in both years. As you can see, Canada had the highest percentage of young people at university in both years by 70 and 80 percent, while the proportion of university students in America was the lowest in 2005. Here you can see the proportion of American students was the lowest in 2005 by 40 percent as compared to other countries. So this is the end of our video. Hope you learned something. I will see you guys in the next video. If you like this video then hit on the like button. Share this video with your family and friends. And subscribe to our channel for more IELTS related videos. Thank you and all the very best for your IELTS exam. Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening. Thank you.